think that's, that's a key because I think sometimes we focus on one half of the equation and we don't focus enough on the other half. But the solution, I think, is a common solution to both halves of the equation. So if we talk about power, I would break this down um, um, into, and I was just thinking this on the train this morning, so if it's half-baked, uh, please, please accept this. But if we talk about power, I, I would say there's, we could break this down into sort of four elements of power, or four stages of power. The first stage would be what we talk about, and, and we, a term we use very broadly, and that's empower, right? How do we give people, or how do we help people um, acquire the tools they need to take power. And I'm a firm believer that nobody ever gives power to people. You earn it, you take it, right? Uh, and you do something with it. But rarely is someone going to turn around and hand you power. And so the question is, when we, when we think about the phases of empowerment, empowerment is, is, is but the first phase. And that's taking control of your own life and taking control of, of, of your destiny and, 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 and standing up and, and, and demanding something. The second phase is winning power, right? So we've, we've moved people then into the political phase of things and the policy phase of things. And we're talking about how do you earn the respect for your ideas and how do you then be able to convert that into winning power? And I think we're pretty good at that one too. We, we look at my, our sister institutes at India and IRI, they do a lot with with, with uh, helping women in political parties advance their agendas. But I think we'll also hear from Nigeria today about that struggle and how it's still going on. So once you've won power, you then need to take power. And taking power is something that, that I would refer to as the consolidation, right? So, so you've won the opportunity. You've, you've been elected to office. You've, you've, you've gained economic power. Somehow you have advanced and you have won the power. Then the question becomes, how do you use power? And how do you make the change happen? And if I think about a, a, a political leader who was very effective in both taking power and using power, I think Margaret Thatcher is probably a great example of a political leader who was able to convert the access she was given into real power. And she had a program and she had a plan. So what then is the secret sauce that gets us to move from empowerment to use of power? Well, at SIPE, I think we believe and we've learned over the years that in order to, to uh, allow the individual to, to really empower themselves and to take their, their role in society, collective action uh, is often the secret to this. And in, in, in SIPE, we look at collective action through the lens of associations and chambers of commerce. And for us, it's vitally important We, over the years to, to, to equip women and women's business associations and women's chambers of commerce with the skills they need to start working uh, in any setting, whether it's women's associations or, or other associations. Um, in many countries, associations are small, fragmented, and weak. And the need to start working across organizations with partners, identifying who else you're working with. We work with people on how do you start reaching out uh, to other members of the community who share your goals and how do you start working with them on that. Which takes me to our fourth area, which is about developing processes. We can bring people into a room, but if they don't understand the process of dialogue and coming to a conclusion on issues, then it becomes rather fraught and we often lose the initiative on that point. And, and the secret here is that it, there are processes that work, and it's teaching people how to use dialogue uh, to, and, and issue identification and prioritization uh, as, as steps to try and move you through that. And then finally, the other piece that we have, have to, to work with the business community on is how to be a constructive partner with government. Because you're not going to get the change you need unless you can show up with the plan in hand and convince people that your plan is the right plan. And I can tell you that in many countries we work in, there often isn't a plan. And if you are the group that shows up with the plan in hand, with the solution, you'll win. And it's getting people to understand how to put that plan forward and how to advocate it effectively. So I would, I would posit that those are the four, the four areas to empower women five key lessons, which, which really examines about how you move uh, into this area. And Denise Baer, the director of our evaluations uh, department, Shujana, who's standing uh, in the lobby, I think.
uh, back there. And Barb have all had a hand in, in putting this paper together. It's available online, and I would I would recommend that you have a look at it. But I get on to our panel today because you, you you don't want to hear me speaking all morning because we have do have uh, special guests here that I'm going to allow Dr. Kim Betcher uh, to introduce. But I will just suffice to say that our guests from Nigeria and Afghanistan are examples of uh, effective women's advocacy organizations when it comes to business in the private sector. Um, they bring with them both, I think, perspectives on the hurdles that are in place, but also, and I think more inspiring, what you can do in very difficult situations, whether it's a culturally difficult situation as in Afghanistan, or whether it's in a, in a, in a very difficult business environment, which is the case of Nigeria and cultural environment, um, how you can advance the interests of women business owners uh, and those who wish to become business owners within society. So with that, I will turn it over to Kim Betcher and he can do the formal introductions. And I just extend to you our thanks for joining us today uh, and, and best wishes for a productive discussion. Thank you, Andrew. Good morning. How's the volume back there? Good. Excellent. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the National Endowment for Democracy for funding CIPE's work in Nigeria and Afghanistan, and the Bureau of Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor at the State Department for supporting our new work getting started on a Women's Business Resource Center and a Women's Business Agenda in Afghanistan. The reason I keep coming to work every day at CIPE is that I get to meet extraordinary, courageous people who do things that I didn't think were possible. Today's panelists are people like that. They're gonna be talking to us about the enabling environment for women in the economy, which some of you may know as pillar three of the Women's Global Development and Prosperity Initiative. As Andrew has explained a bit to us, we're talking about the rules of the game for participation in the economy. What are, what are the laws, regulations, norms, practices that are shaping incentives and behavior? This sounds quite daunting to many people, right? It sounds like a big problem, big systemic issues, and, and they are. Uh, but as Andrew has said, there are processes for tackling these things. We have leaders who, who tackle these things. And I'd really like to stress today um, a problem-driven approach. Right? Our panelists will be talking about some very tangible problems affecting women in their countries and then what can business leaders do? What can women in business do to address very focused, defined problems? The first panelist next to me is Fluke Aremokun. Welcome, Fluke. Thank you. Uh, she is an expert trainer at the Association of Nigeria Women in Business and uh, has a variety of institutional experiences um, including at the Ajoke Aisat Afolabi Foundation, uh, working on livelihoods restoration and business ownership for vulnerable women. And, and through um, the Association of Nigerian Women in Business, has become a founding member of the Association of Nigeria Women Business Network. So there are a lot of, a lot of organizations here, but that's because we're talking about coalition building today. Um, Fuluke has a postgraduate degree in public administration as a development practitioner and gender equality, active, um, gender equality advocate. Uh, she has a variety of experiences um, with microfinance, impact assessment, um, entrepreneurship development, and uh, is an author of a paper on entrepreneurship development, business ownership, and women empowerment in Nigeria. To Fuluke's left is Manisha Wafe from Afghanistan, um, currently at the Afghanistan Women Chamber of Commerce and Industry, of which she is founder. And uh, I believe you're a serial entrepreneur. You, you founded a number of organizations. Uh, we'll, we'll, he we'll hear what that's like, uh, in, in, including uh, Peace Through Business Network and uh, Leading Entrepreneurs for Afghanistan's Development. Uh, she has her MBA from the American University of Afghanistan. She's taught more than 400 Afghan businesswomen um, throughout the country and uh, is an author of a training manual on uh, business startups. And I, I, I especially note um, 
this year in Rio at the World Chambers Federation, their Congress, uh, there was an intense competition of chambers and uh, the, the Afghanistan Women's Chamber of Commerce and Industry was the first place winner um, for entrepreneur and small business development. And a cry of joy went up inside for that. <laughs> and my colleague, uh, Barb Langley, uh, who is the director of Site Center for uh, Women's Economic Empowerment, where she has set the strategy for um, our burgeoning women's programming. Uh, Barb is also multi-talented with experience in campaign management, coalition building, and really has a long career um, at, at, uh, at IRI before coming to SAI. Uh, and, and there she was the executive director of the Arab Women's Leadership Initiative, deputy director of the Women's Democracy Network. So welcome to all of us, all of you. Why don't we start with Manisha? And, and talk about what is so important about the enabling environment. And, and is there a problem, as I mentioned, that, that, that's really affecting women and, and, and why this matters? Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. And um, it's such a pleasure to be here this morning and uh, share the floor with these two wonderful ladies and wonderful gentlemen. And um, Yes, so it's uh, it's great to share some of the experiences and um, stories from Afghanistan. Uh, the en enabling environment. So for a country like Afghanistan, where um, I would say that the environment is not only um, it's it's even not neutral, but more it's it's discouraging to women. So in such a country, we of course need a lot of uh, initiatives and activities to enable the environment uh, for women. Because um, for women, starting from uh, going to, for example, the government office to register a business or to report for their taxation, uh, that the environment is not very encouraging and it's, um, it's uh, very, um, uh, as I said, discouraging and that women uh, would uh, feel um, not safe and would not feel very welcoming. Um, to, for example, um, bigger uh, work such as government contracting or um, access to finance or um, access to markets. Uh, these are the, the issues that women face, for example, in Afghanistan. And so definitely we need to do um, uh, work for, uh, their, um, for, for enabling the environment for them. Um, for example, one of the things that we started when, as an AWCCI that we did was uh, to ask the government, the president and the minister of uh, industry and commerce and the minister of uh, finance to uh, open a, a women only uh, counter or um, women uh, window for women at the registration office and as well as a window at the taxation office. Because these were the two places that women would go and would not be welcomed or would not be given enough information or the right information so they process their documents. So this would be, this is as basic as it is. And then the second thing was for the very established uh, businesses was uh, the government contract. So for a long time, uh, women businesses existed, um, a number of them, for example, especially in the service uh, industries, such as IT services, media services, uh, printing, uh, which are you know, basic services that the government would need, or logistics, freight forwarding, shipment. Uh, but they uh, had never access to government contracts. So the second thing was that we went to the government and we asked the um, uh, National Procurement Authority to uh, put a preferential, preferential clause or a set-aside um, um, amount of uh, contracts for women-owned businesses, businesses in the country. And so um, we uh, didn't get a set-aside but we got a 5% preferential clause in our uh, national procurement procedure. So women-owned businesses, they get uh, five extra scores when they, um, uh, they apply for a bid uh, as women-owned businesses. And if they're uh, certified by Afghanistan Women's Chamber of Commerce as a women-owned business and women-led business, uh, which is another you know, initiative that we had to do because uh, you know, in, a, in a country like Afghanistan, including the you know, um, of course, social cultural barriers and corruption and uh, other systematic 
uh, barriers they, that they would face uh, going into government offices. Um, they, uh, they, they could not, without you know, having a prefer preference, they would not access uh, go uh, government contracts. And today with the 5% preferential clause in the national procurement uh, procedure, at least uh, for the last uh, one year, since 2018 that we got this clause approved in the national uh, procurement procedure, some efforts are being made. So the National Procurement Authority, together with, the, with uh, us, uh, we are training uh, women uh, business owners on um, the contracting procedure, how to apply for the contracts, and uh, we, um, and in the National Procurement Authority, uh, they have uh, an institute. They even um, come and train our women on some of the tricks, you know, how to, uh, you know, how to put together the documents so well that, you know, even when the, um, the officer who's checking all the documents before really giving it for the review, they, they should not, the documents should not be in a way that they just put it aside. Um, so, you know, as tricks as little as, you know, the copy of your license, how it should be copied, or the co a copy of your uh, other documents such as taxation and so on. So uh, these are, you know, the, the issues that, that uh, we have to work with uh, women. And then on, for example, um, access to infrastructure, um, another very um, major uh, issue in Afghanistan. Uh, for everybody, but majorly for women, uh, we had to ask the president to um, uh, allocate or um, allow us to establish women mini industrial parks. Uh, and also, uh, this was the time when um, they were putting together the um, industrial uh, parks policy. And so uh, mentioning uh, to the president and to the High Economic Council where we have a seat, it's um, a decision-making and uh, policy-making um, table chaired by the president himself with a lot of the ministers, uh, especially the ministers related to the sector. Um, so uh, when we mentioned so many times that women face a lot of issues with uh, infrastructure, especially having land, um, you know, leasing government buildings and so on for their uh, business work. Uh, so it, it was a time when the president again, you know, said, okay, let's allocate a piece of, uh, let, let's allocate uh, a percentage of Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, okay. Um, so um, the government, um, yeah. So they agreed with us to allocate 15 to 25 percent of industrial parks lands to SMEs and women-owned businesses. And today, uh, AWCCI, we have um, seat also at the industrial parks um, um, review committee. So when applications are sent in. And then the Ministry of Industry and Commerce, they have to review the applications for the industrial parks land. Uh, we have a woman sitting at that committee to look if, um, if women's applications are, um, are there and SME's applications are there for a piece of land, that they're given uh, preference over others or that allocation is considered, that 15 to 25% of each industrial park should be allocated to women. So, you know, this is as, you know, as small as having a window at the um, uh, registration office or taxation office and as big as government contracting or uh, infrastructure, land, and um, uh, in, in the industrial parks. Great. Now, to deepen our appreciation of the situation, what is it like, tell us, uh, to be a woman, entrepreneur, a woman in business operating in, in Afghanistan? Um, are, are the barriers distinctive to, to women uh, compared to uh, a male entrepreneur? Some of the barriers are. Uh, some of the barriers that are uh, common for both uh, men and women, women, um, of course, uh, they face, they have to really uh, get that burden doubled. Or financing uh, loans are expensive overall in Afghanistan. Uh, it's expensive, I mean, the interest rate is high, the um, collateral is really um, high, and the um, repayment period is very short. Uh, and for a period of time, we did not have even um, a grace period for the loans. 
So as soon as you would get the loan, the next month you had to start uh, repaying your loan. Uh, but you know, it, as a, as a man, uh, a man on a business or as a man, uh, it's much easier because you either um, own your family's property for the collateral, or you have of your own as as a man because it was easier for you to um, have um, again resources to uh, buy. Or when the family bought the property, um, it was already you know uh, the man because they were doing the deal, so so he got it under his name. So you know, for for a man, it's easy to have the collateral and to um, because of the size of the business to pay a little bit higher interest rate and also to uh, to start repaying the next month uh, because again they have maybe a better uh, business uh, situation. Uh, but for women, um, you know, access to collateral or to, um, you know, because they do not have access to regular sales um, or, as I said, the government contracts or uh, other uh, contracts in terms of, again, you know, um, having regular sales, uh, this makes it difficult for uh, them to really um, get that loan, high interest uh, collateral and um, uh, repayment, you know, as soon as you get it. Uh, those are... Uh, you know, like double, <coughs> double uh, situation for for women, double double barrier for a women uh, women business owner in Afghanistan. Yes, thank you, thank you, Fumute. Same question for you. Why is the enabling environment so important? And are you seeing the same barriers or dealing with the same barriers in Nigeria? Uh, well, uh, thank you. First, let me just say thank you to everybody, to every taxpayer in you know, here. The, your, yes, I want to say thank you because your money is you know, working. We are you know, seeing results. But sometimes you think, oh, you are putting money, you are not seeing the results, but you'll be surprised at what is happening in Nigeria. Historically, in Nigeria, women are seen as property. A man's you no know, property. The man owns you. So even when the man you know, passes, the family members will you know, take you on as property for the wife or the brother or the uncle or the grandfather or whoever. But that is you know, changing. There are cultural barriers. Um, even looking at employment, paid employment, government employment, you have more men you know, going into uh, paid employment than you know, female because that's how the society is structured. I don't know in any country where for you to join the police force as a woman you need to take permission, you know, if you are going to get married. Nigerian police, up until last year, would employ only single, you know, ladies. And when you want to get married, you are going to get permission, you know, from the police authority to get married and to get pregnant. I don't know where that happens, except in Nigeria. But that was then. Thankfully for what you are doing in our side, women you know, had the voice you know, to speak and government to listen. Um, you are talking about businesses, access to you know, um, funds to finance, it's a problem for women. Because like she said, we don't have the collateral. Women don't have property, landed you know, property. So that was one of the things that ANWBN took on with the Central Bank of Nigeria. And today, as I speak you know, here, in 2017, the Central Bank of Nigeria had to step in you know, to look at the issue of movable assets so that more women can have access you know, to funds. We also have representation. Nigeria is, has a population of 186 UN estimate, United Nations estimate. Out of the population, 49.4 of the population are characterized as female. But when you talk about representation in government, you have only 4%. And if you don't have women at the table taking decisions, on economic policy. Tell me, how would you have them contribute, you know, and benefit from <coughs> policies, from what is going on in government? Because like he said, em empowerment is not just about uh, participating in an economy. It's not just about contributing to the economy. It's also about benefiting. So women have been restricted to contribute, to participate in the economy at very, very low level informal level. That's why most women businesses are not registered. And part of the advocacy you know, we are putting up has you know, um, helped us in terms of registration processes. 
Now in Nigeria, you can register your business just in two days. It used to be um, like 15 days, averagely, 15 days to register your business, and it takes you no know, time. You know, for some, you go over and over, but now you can do it online. It's part of you know um, your help, you know, to build our capacity. We know now. We know now as women that we can engage and have some you know our policy you know reforms, and we can have government you know listen to us. Let's talk about the insecurity. I don't know how many of us are familiar with um, the Nigerian security you know, situation. It's 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 it's, it's, um, it's bad for women who are in business. You are going out early in the morning as a trader. You are you, you know you are afraid because you know there are hoodlums you know, who will come after you. In Nigeria, you have people you know uh, men attacking women to take their underwears. I don't know where that happens. It's only in my country. Not you won't have robber attack you for money. They just want to take female underwear, you know, to process and, and, and use um, as ritual for, for money. So it's, 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 we have a whole lot of issues. In the northeast um, part of Nigeria, you also have the issue of insurgency. And when you have uh, violence, women's, uh, women are the ones who suffer you know, from violence. Their businesses you know, suffer. They are the ones who are in there. They are not part of um, the group to take decisions when it comes to resolution. We, we are, we're not part of the discussion. And this is also affecting um, women and their businesses you know, to grow. But thankfully, with what SIPE is doing, we are able to engage and we are seeing results. We are not yet there. We know we can do better. And that's why we are looking up to everyone in this room, you know, with SIPE, to support SIPE, to help us. We have a network that is vibrant in Nigeria. The ANWBN is a network of 18 founding members. And in this um, um, October, we are, we are getting 20 more members join us because they see what we are doing. In the introductory remarks, we, we, we recognize the importance of having a policy document, a document that will help you engage in your policymakers. We are not just going to um, government you know, to speak uh, individually. Now we are relying on our collective efforts to engage and also to have um, situation turned in our favor. That's where we are now. Okay, fantastic. Thank you so much. Barb, uh, you, you have a view of a variety of regions of the world. Um, how do you think about um, knowing the barriers as an outsider? Sure. And, and, and where to focus the effort. Sure. I think, first of all, I feel very humbled to sit on the panel with my two colleagues, honestly. Um, my dirty little secret is that I'm not an entrepreneur, um, but I did grow up in an entrepreneurial family, so I've actually seen the struggles of my parents and my grandparents um, over the years trying to figure out how to make the business work over bad times and trying to figure out workarounds when there have been problems with um, taxes or registration or the economies kind of turned upside down and things like that. So, you know, as a child and a, a young adult coming up in that, that environment, it had an impact on me. And now, um, I'm fortunate enough in my job, um, working in coalitions and, and working across the globe actually on women's empowerment um, in the economy, and before that, women's political empowerment, to listen and to learn what the barriers are um, and to understand. And I think one of the things that I've found is that while the situations um, in each country and each region might be very different, the problems are actually very similar. And the solutions are actually very similar in a way as well. Um, and I hope that I uh, don't steal some of the, the comments necessarily, but I, I learned so much just in our conversations yesterday. Um, you know, we talked a bit about access to finance for women um, and the issue of collateral and things like that. But then Manisha reminded me that even when um, those uh, mechanisms exist and there are incentives put in place for women to access loans, to scale up their businesses, oftentimes you, you run into um, women entrepreneurs that um, still find that whole process daunting. Um, it might be for their education, their background, their confidence level, but to walk into a bank and sit down with a loan officer alone in an office perhaps with a male that they don't know is very intimidating. Um, and so we saw this, for example, in Bangladesh uh, with our partners from the Bangladesh Women's Chamber of Commerce and Industry. And as they were taking on the idea of how commercial loans were structured, 
in that country, they were also looking at um, the, the mechanisms and how it's implemented. Um, and so they worked with the banks to make sure that the commercial loan desks were either staffed with female loan officers facing and, and ready to, to take care of them um, as best they could. Um, we often see the issue of security um, across the board. Um, Feluca had, had you know, talked to us a bit, you know, if you think about women in some of these countries and in developing markets, they don't necessarily have um, the, uh, the means to own a car or a bus or transportation to get their goods to market. So they rely on public transportation, which opens them to in increased vulnerability to attack or robbery or, or what have you, and they're often traveling in the wee hours of the morning. Um, we also have talked about, and you see this run across uh, both political empowerment and <coughs> economic empower empowerment, is the freedom of assembly. So for women to come together um, when they have all the responsibilities at home for care of the children or care of elderly in their family, um, trying to find the time, make the time to, to gather as a collective is often difficult. And then if they're trying to access those networks um, that tend to be dominated by men, um, typically those meetings may happen after hours, um, late at night often. And you know it might not just be safety and security, but it's, it's your reputation, it's your name as a woman, um, that if you go out after dark to meet a group of men, that you might be labeled a prostitute or something like that. It's, you know, those, those gossip circles that run in every culture. Um, so I think that, you know, when we, when we look at this, there's a lot of commonalities. And I think that if we can really tackle even just a portion of these problems, just think of the opportunity that has for us as a global community. It's not just impacting that woman and her family and her community and her country, but it opens up opportunity for all of us. Right. We've already started talking about collective action, getting women in the private sector. We really focus um, on, on domestic private sector here, um, getting women engaged, getting them involved, giving them voice. Uh, so my question to you, uh, both of you, is um, whose interests are you representing? Um, what, what makes you credible? And, 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 and why should decision makers listen to you, right? Uh, Manisha? Um, in our case, um, let me um, give you a little bit of background of um, how we started, which gives us uh, huge uh, credibility. Uh, so we uh, uh, started as an alumni association of a program that um, has been training and mentoring Afghan women uh, for the last uh, 12 years called Peace Through Business. Um, and I was the first, the first student of this program in 2007 and from 2008 onward I uh, am the trainer and country facilitator of the program um, as well besides everything else that I'm doing. Um, so that's why I've trained more than 450 uh, women business owners in Afghanistan. Uh, so after two three years of the training program uh, we because we wanted the alumni to remain um, connected and pay it forward uh, we decided that we need to create our alumni association. So we did that, and that's why we were calling it Peace Through Business Network and not alumni association, because in Afghanistan it does not make sense to say alumni association. Um, and then um, after a while, um, we realized that um, we did not have any uh, bigger platform to really uh, do policy advocacy as uh, business women. All of us uh, were facing many issues, uh, but uh, there were uh, no one and no uh, organization to really uh, use it or use that platform to do that uh, policy advocacy and reflect our uh, concerns and interests. So we got together with a number of other business women and we um, established a leading entrepreneurs for Afghanistan's uh, development lead. And um, it was a Women's Chamber of Commerce and the Bangladesh Women's Chamber of Commerce. So there were, there were a number of them, Sri Lanka Chamber of uh, Women's Chamber of Commerce. Uh, that we met uh, through these uh, networks meetings um, and we got really inspired that, oh, why, why can't, can't we have our own Women's Chamber of Commerce? But when we established LEAD, we did not have uh, the right political support and also in Afghanistan, we did not have any law, law or procedure to, um, to register a chamber or you know, how to go about it if we want to uh, make it a chamber. 
Um, so we, uh, we, we called ourselves ourselves leading entrepreneurs for advancing develop development is, and registered it as a women business association a business union uh, and then after uh, after a while when we really um, got um, uh, a little bit bigger in terms of organization and as well as some of the fundamental things that we really wanted to do especially for our advocacy work one of which was putting together a database of uh, business women in Afghanistan for this strength but also to show you know that uh, when we talk, we're talking about this number of people, this number of uh, women-owned businesses. And so the database, um, to give you a little bit of information today that we're talking uh, about this database, we have more than uh, 1,200 women-owned businesses in Afghanistan, and they are um, less than half of this number are in traditional handicraft kind of businesses, but more than half of this number are in non-traditional businesses. And, and non by non-traditional, I mean all kinds of things in male-dominant sectors as well. Construction, logistics, IT services, media services, um, uh, travel agencies, restaurants, exporting, manufacturing, all those kind of uh, things. Uh, so we, uh, when we did that uh, database and as well as we started really meeting uh, the First Lady of Afghanistan uh, in 2015 and 2016, and when we informed her of what we had done and how we, we had done it, with what kind of resources we had done it, and how everything came about. It was not, it was not a big international organization's uh, funding or project who came and who asked us to put together this organization. It was us. It was Afghan business women who came up with these smaller organizations and established such, a, such an advocacy platform. And now uh, we, are in this, we were in the stage at that time to talk about those numbers, like um, th these, uh, so it was <coughs> end of 2015, beginning of 2016, when the numbers were only 680 in our database. Uh, so when we started talking about that, when we started talking about the number of the amount of investment that all of them had made together, like it was 66.8 million dollar at that time, in the number of employment, around 40,000 uh, jobs that they had created, the women-owned businesses. It was interesting, uh, for, for for example, for the First Lady and for a number of other government and international organizations. And then, um, and then one of the things that uh, we were asked uh, after a while um, from the First Lady's office and First Lady that, um, so so what do you want to do, uh, really? Um, because we had presented a number of um, uh, recommendations for the challenges and barriers that women were facing in the country. Uh, we uh, saw that this was a good opportunity to not to first uh, talk about the problems and those recommendation, recommendations that we had given because those seemed smaller to us. We, we, saw, we thought that this was a good opportunity to say that we want to change the name of the organization from leading entrepreneurs for Afghanistan's development lead, which was difficult for people to understand that what we were doing, to a women's chamber because this was much uh, easier and stronger to show to everybody that we're a women's chamber of commerce and a national women's chamber of commerce. So we told her that this is what we wanted wanted to do first before everything else. And she said, "Okay, give me a letter to the president." We wrote a letter to the president uh, and sent it to her. She gave it to the president, and in a week time, we received a call from our um, High Economic Council Secretariat, where I was telling you before that. We have a seat uh, now in that council. Uh, and they were telling us that uh, the president has referred your letter to us, and they want you to come and uh, present your case, how LEAD is uh, ready to become Afghanistan Women's Chamber of Commerce, and why there is a need for a separate Chamber of Commerce for women in Afghanistan. Uh, so why don't you prepare a five-page um, or whatever uh, proposal, more detailed, because we only had written a letter. Um, and why don't you prepare also a presentation, and then we will put you in the, um, in the agenda of the High Economic Council. You can come and present uh, that. So we did that. We really wrote a five, six page of uh, a proposal where we explained how LEAD started, how um, LEAD was ready to become Afghanistan Women's Chamber of Commerce, and as well as um, we, um, uh, uh, why there was a need for a separate uh, Women's Chamber. Uh, commerce in Afghanistan. 
and uh, they had sent that um, proposal to all the High Economic Council members before the meeting, um, and then um, uh, and then uh, because ACCI, Afghanistan Chamber of Commerce and Industry, they were also a member of uh, High Economic Council, and they received that uh, proposal that we had put together, and when they saw, they were like, oh, no, 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 we cannot allow this to happen. They wrote a nine-page document to say that why there is no need for women to establish this, this Chamber of Commerce, and, and you know, a lot of statements saying that women cannot, women will not be able to run it, and those kind of things. And so, uh, we, of course, we went to the High Economic Council, it did not end there, we did our presentation on March 12, uh, 2017, and we got our approval. And then uh, when we got our approval, also a number of uh, men industrialists, they got the courage that, wow, if they can do it, uh, they can also uh, go and ask for their own chamber because they, they also wanted to get separate from the um, Afghanistan Chamber of Commerce and Industry. They wanted to have their Chamber of Industries and Mines. They did. They also <laughs> did put together their uh, coalition, collective um, action together. They went to the, again to the High Economic Council like us, did their presentation, they also got their approval. And when the, these two chambers, when we were established, I'll be now quick on, on this uh, other little story about the chamber's law that we have now in place in the country. Um, so when the, two, when the two of us were um, uh, given approval by the High Economic Council to function as a chamber of commerce, a chamber in, in Afghanistan, the two of us, because the law was only for that one chamber to function in the country, needed to be changed. So we went and asked the president, but now there's a need to also change the law. So he immediately asked the Minister of Industry and Commerce to work with us to put together a new draft of the law for chambers, chambers re regulation. We only had one chamber, but now it's a chambers It did not come anywhere for, for six months until again we met the president of Afghanistan on uh, December 31st, uh, 2018, and we asked him um, for that. We asked him that the law was sitting at the Ministry of Justice for six months, and they're not processing it because there were intentions that we will not allow this law to be passed. I mean, some other people. And so these two other chambers, they should not really get uh, a legitimate um, presence in Afghanistan. And so slowly they can be, um, they can be um, dissolved uh, back. And so um, when we asked him and we informed him that we, uh, this was not processed, uh, he immediately um, asked the Ministry of Justice to process that and bring it to the cabinet for approval. And, um, and then it was there. In just uh, a matter of another three weeks, that law came to the cabinet and it was passed. So now, by law, the existence of Afghanistan Women's Chamber of Commerce and Afghanistan Chamber of Industry and Mines, uh, and if other chambers would, would like to come in existence, uh, would be allowed and we are, um, we are fully legitimate. Great. And, and, and that's fantastic. <laughs> and, okay. uh, and, and amazing that you got both the law and you have the, the, the real institution as well. Mm -hmm. uh, Faluke, what is your story of getting policy attention, getting influence? Uh, well, first, I just want to talk about uh, our credibility as mm -hmm. a network. Uh, the first one is about our size. For 18, I know, very active, robust. Uh, women organizations to come together to form, you know, a network shows credibility, shows trust. In terms of size, we are 920,000 members now. And by the end of October, that will double. That's in terms of size. Also, I, in terms of the work that we have done, the International Press Center and Groffin, they developed a platform, the Sheet Press ITC platform. 
they saw no other network, you know, to do that. But A and WBN to recruit women on that platform. And we did that, you know, on the ITC, the She Trace ITC platform. That shows the trust that even um, institutions have in the A and WBN. And if there was any organization that has developed a national women business agenda in Nigeria, that organization is the ANWBN, the network. That's the only you know, uh, network that has that. And um, 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 also, you have coalition in Nigeria, but there's no coalition that is focused on women only. You have them, you know, male, female, but this one, Specifically, we are looking at the issues of uh, uh, women, and we have an, a business agenda, that agenda to prove it in terms of the priority issues that you know uh, we have identified and the engagement we have had. If you look at the slides that has been shown, we presented our the business agenda to top decision makers, the Senate President, and all other top you know executives in different agencies, departments, and ministries of government. And they're working with it. That's why we have some of these changes in access to finance. We're talking about registration of business. That's why we are seeing all you know, uh, the changes. And um, in March this year, sometimes we talk nice and sometimes we move. You know, we're a movement. When you move, you, 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 you conduct a march. We march across Nigeria to different you know, uh, legislative you know, houses. And I tell you, I was part of the march in Lagos. And what happened? Government in Lagos State now, for the number of men that were appointed into executive positions increased, we have 33 percent women appointees. It wasn't like that before, because when we saw the way it was with the elective you know, position that women were not getting, you know, um, were not representing their parties in as, as candidates, we, did, we didn't. Uh, we saw it drop. It dropped to four percent nationally and even some states. No female representation. So we thought we're not going to have all male, you know, appointees sit again. Then we took, you know, that, that's the match. That's the match. This was in Lagos. There were others in other parts of Nigeria, you know. And that got, got us some results that states are now considering increasing the number of female appointees into executive you know, positions. So we have, you know, the results to show, you know, for that. And if for any reason you still don't believe that we're a credible organization, the fact that SIPE has been behind this network for almost 10 years shows how credible we are, how credible the work we are doing. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Barb, when it comes to coalition building, empowering women, mobilizing them on policy work, what can go wrong? What's, what's, You're throwing me a curveball. <laughs> what's, what's the difference between sure. you know, a happy ending sure. and, and a disaster? Absolutely. You know, I think, um, uh, I'll throw my notes away. <laughs> um, I've seen this actually in the coalitions that I've worked at um, with the Women's Democracy Network over at uh, the International Republican Institute. And I also see it here at SITE with the work that we're doing with the, the women's coalitions in Nigeria, Afghanistan, and, and elsewhere. Um, I think one of the first kind of pitfalls that can happen is when we as an organization or as we as a funding institution or an international community come in with the agenda and try to set the agenda and try to push certain issues forward um, uh, without that local buy-in. So, you know, the conversely then, the success that I have seen is where you know, the, the international community comes in and gives a bit of neutrality. It offers um, organizations a safe <coughs> space to work together, um, a safe space to make decisions together, um, and to have a, a community that is perhaps a, a bit less competitive than if they tried to do it on their own. Um, so I think the first pitfall is uh, coming in, trying to set an agenda. The second pitfall is, um, you see this a lot when we're trying to organize these coalitions where they say, you know, we have a history with this other organization, um, and it's not necessarily good, so how do we work with them on a common issue and common ground? So uh, a lot of what we as an organization can do is, again, lend that neutrality, give that credibility, uh, give space to really show these organizations and these coalitions 
what are the common issues that we agree on, um, and how do we formulate a way forward in terms of coalition building? Um, those are the two big things that popped to mind, actually. stay in that office for more than two years, one term. So, you know, when you try to uh, say uh, maybe two terms, then people try to perpetuate themselves, you know, into... So it, it has helped, you know, the way... So everybody is, you know, carried along. You could be called at any point in time to represent the network. You know, that puts your interest in it. It's, you, you don't think that this is theirs. We take it, this is ours. It's collective, collective action. And that's what we learn from you that when we come together, and that's the slogan of the network, work together, work far. Work together, you work far. So all of us, from what we have learned, we're now you know, doing our best to work together because we want to go far. Don't you want to go far? Yes. And honestly, this example is um, uh, something that I've seen, as I said, in, in both political and in these economic coalitions. That formula where, um, you know, just as, for taking SIPE as an example, we have a, a proven program module that applies pretty much anywhere that we go, um, but we adapt it and we implement it perhaps uh, with economic experts such as Dr. Betcher here and um, uh, the others in our network around the globe. Uh, they have some confidence in terms of what it is that their, their work, um, that it can improve the market space. Um, and often you find that it not only improves the market space for women in business, but also for men. Now, I want everybody to know, we're talking about the enabling environment, and we're getting words of inspiration. Mm -hmm. So this, this really is meaningful work. I'm going to go to the audience in just a moment for some questions, but first I'd like a, a lightning round real quick on, on, on what is your advice what, what is your recommendation? Um, so um, let, let's start with Barb in, in terms of practitioners. Um, mm -hmm. What works, um, what do we need to do better? Mm -hmm. I think two things, um, invest in locally led initiatives, just going back to that key point. Um, when you allow uh, the issues and ideas to be identified locally and to be challenged locally, solved locally, it works. You, you get great impact. Um, I think also uh, networking. It seems so simple and I feel like people take it for granted that there already exist these numerous networks for women in business to network, and there probably are, but yet everywhere I go, whether it's in Africa, whether it's uh, Latin America, uh, Europe, the Middle East and North Africa, women's business associations and chambers of commerce are saying, Barb, we really need to come together. I need to network with other business associations within the region to understand what they're doing, how they're doing, how they're improving member services, how they're advocating. I need to network uh, globally, internationally, everything like that. They also, uh, of course, are interested in the business and, and getting their products to market. So there's there's a number of ways to, to be helpful to these entrepreneurs and the associations in networking. All right, well, Luke, uh, we have a, a number of donors in the room and private sector. Uh, they are interested in empowering women. Where can they best allocate their resources, their investments? Uh, well, I, I, I want to say that the underlying connection between um, sound democratic institutions and uh, a prosperous economy is gender equality. Uh, I, I, I don't want um, 
I will advise that we don't wait until uh, 2021 before we start investing you know, in the democratic process you know, of Nigeria, because that's what I've observed, that uh, we wait until uh, a year before the election, then we are focusing just on election to the negligence of uh, businesses. It shouldn't be like that. There are, ANWPN is poised you know, to uh, drive the conversation on uh, women representation further. We, we, we need to find a way to engage women in business, in business to uh, be a part of the political process. As it were, because of cultural um, uh, barriers, women are, um, business women are shying away from the political process. And one thing that um, uh, politics or politicians you know, recognize, they recognize the importance of number. We have the number. They also know the importance of money. Without money, women cannot go far. So please, if there's anywhere you need to invest in, I think we should look at that, to empower women in a way that women are not just contributing, uh, they're not just participating in the process, they're not just contributing from that process, but they are also benefiting. That is the whole concept of empowerment, that we are able to participate at the higher level, not at this low level, that we are able to contribute at the higher level and also benefit. Thank you. That's a great point. Uh, Manisha, what advice, I mean, to an international audience, where should we put our effort? Okay, first of all, um, I would say that um, it has been your support that Afghan women today have become professionals and we have become um, experienced and we have got a whole um, amount of uh, knowledge from everywhere um, in the world because you know we got exposed to so many uh, networks through your support. And so uh, today you can look at us as your partners and not as your uh, beneficiaries. Um, and second of all, uh, let's work on substantials. Um, so when we say, um, Afghan women have uh, a problem or challenge accessing markets. Let's look at uh, what does it mean and what does it all take to really access market and, and do um, sales and have uh, access to buyers. It's not only about that um, superficial and, um, and very um, uh, easy job of it, for example, to say, okay, let's give them access to exhibitions and business uh, conferences and business matchmakings. Let's look at it that, okay, how? If she uh, has not ever participated in an exhibition, if her product is really able to be presented in that exhibition, and if she has not participated ever in a business matchmaking, how would she really go and talk and present herself and uh, do those uh, business negotiations. So it's even it's even there, you know, we have to start from there to really teach her all those skills and, and give her all that knowledge that, okay, when you go and participate in that time, in this exhibition, we are giving you access, but we have, let's, let's work first on these other stuff. Um, and similarly, if you're talking about, let's say, access to uh, finance is an issue, um, like we were talking yesterday. Uh, access to finance uh, is not about just going to uh, to the bank and or to the central bank to, to make the terms easier for women, um, but also, or for example, some legal issues in terms of collateral and those kind of things. But also, it's about the women uh, businesses themselves uh, internally. So whether she has the right skills or the, the right uh, knowledge about loans and how to handle loans whether she has uh, the right um, uh, documentations and the right uh, business procedures in her company to really handle that loan. Mm -hmm. um, so really, uh, with these two examples, let's work really on substantials. Thank you. Great, so it's about access, it's about power, and about removing the barriers at, at whatever level they may be. I'd like to take a couple of questions now, and uh, to make this as interactive as possible, two ways. Um, please keep your questions brief, and as they say, have them end with a question mark. Um, I, I have uh, one here, a lady here, and then a lady back here. Take two, and then we'll do another round. Hi, uh, my name is Maria Luisa Boyce. I'm with UPS, and, and thank you so much for the event and, and the inspiration. Um, 
I, I wanted to ask you how, so we talk about, I'm gonna bring it a little bit from a business side, how technology is causing changes, right? How do you see technology helping in Nigeria if there's access to technology, right? In Nigeria, we have seen the experience of the phones make a difference, right? The access to the phone or WhatsApp, etc. But do you see that as an area that can help better? We can't hear better. Okay, I'll, oh, I'll, I'll repeat the question. Okay, better now. Okay, so my question is about technology. How has technology, or do you see technology helping in Nigeria, providing an opportunity for women? Um, and and how? What will be the areas that you think might be needed to partner from industry to help? enhance the situation. Okay, so a question about access to technology and, and partnerships with business. And then I'll take one more question now. Um, hi, uh, Stephanie Foster, Smash Strategies. I actually worked with Manisha in Afghanistan, so um, happy to be part of this conversation. I'm curious because um, everybody talked about the need to both have women in the public sort of political sphere and economic sphere, and I think that's really important. So I'm curious about on the ground, how is that working? Are there barriers to women in business getting engaged in politics or you know, in the groups that really deal with women in public life? And how can that be addressed? Because they, sometimes groups of people are siloed in what they do. And so I'm curious about how to really make that happen on the ground so that the political process can take advantage of the amazing talent and skill and expertise that women like uh, you all represent have. All right. Um, and I apologize, Manisha had to step out. Okay. Not being scared. Okay. So, um, either of those questions? Yeah. Um, uh, talking about um, uh, technology, uh, I'll say the cost of technology itself is an issue. So, if we could have, you know, more, you know, um, organizations get involved in that in Nigeria to bring down the cost, you know, of uh, technology, the internet, for instance. It, um, sometimes you, you 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 can do a survey, you know, maybe of ten women, and you see that only three or so have access you know, to the internet because of the cost. Uh, or some who have uh, some with the internet access, they turn it on and off to save you know data to save you no know, cost. So if we have the cost you know reduced, it will help more women you know, uh, go into uh, use technology, and also in terms of training. Uh, we, we, we try our best to train women at um, the low level, informal level, to make use of POS, for instance, not to rely on cash or no transaction, uh, but it's just the little we can do. We need you know, more investment you know, in that you know, sector. And also training them on how to make use of online you know, um, companies you know, for the marketing of their products. So there's so much opportunity in terms of uh, bringing down the cost you know, of uh, technology and also the use of uh, technology for marketing, uh, of, of uh, product you know, marketing. That's, uh, there are opportunities you know, there that we could you know, work together on. Talking about um, uh, participation of uh, business women in politics, uh, one thing we also need to work on is to change the narrative. Um, in Nigeria, women, they are so eager to have uh, female representation. So the, the narrative you know, now is, oh, just vote for any woman. No matter the party, vote for a woman. Uh, we, we, we think that will not be sustainable because uh, women in a political party cannot vote for women in another party. Uh, that would be disloyal. So what we are saying, what we think should be done is to train women from now to be able to hold political parties you know, accountable. To you know, train women to be able to identify a political party that has an agenda for women, that you know, um, is talking about um, uh, is um, providing opportunities you know, uh, through their manifestos on how the party will make infrastructure um, uh, and um, public service and social protection to promote the empowerment of women and girls. So we, we, we are looking forward you know, to having that discussion you know, in a way that we are trained to be able to identify, okay, this party has something um, for women and for family. Thank you. Manisha, did you want to add something on, uh, we had a question about, but on the ground, 
what are the, the real barriers for women in business getting engaged in, in public life or political life? For, it's for business women, are we talking about mm -hmm. all women? Or so just... business women who are, who are interested in, in uh, public activity, community activity, political activity, what are kind of practical barriers that they face? So the kind of uh, practical uh, barriers that they face, uh, I would say, first of all, is the right knowledge and the right set of skills to re really interact in those, um, in those um, situations or in those environments. Because, of course, uh, women for all these years, they were responsible and they are still responsible for the domestic um, responsibilities and they have domestic role and that really uh, consumes a lot of uh, their time. So they cannot really spend time on reading and really uh, building up the knowledge that they need. And of course, because they were not outside the home, they were majorly inside the home. So they do not have that kind of, uh, you know, set, set of skills that's required to really interact. Uh, so every time it's really needed uh, uh, for, for women in order to really enable them and empower them to be part of that, is to uh, give them that kind of special uh, possibilities and opportunities to build their knowledge and skills um, being in those kind of settings. And then, uh, of course, uh, in terms of, um, uh, in terms of um, uh, the, those meetings and those uh, um, uh, gatherings that happen, uh, they uh, need, uh, like she was telling yesterday, that uh, if you if it's after working hours, it's difficult for women to really attend it. Um, it's uh, the same for Afghan women. Uh, women after it's dark, uh, they're either not allowed to be outside, or it's not uh, safe. Um, in a lot of places, it's not safe, but in a lot of places, they're also not allowed to really be outside after it's uh, dark. So that kind of uh, you know. Uh, negotiations have to be made that um, if men, and we do that, for example, at this moment when we have to deal with other chambers and they're, um, they're men, they're a lot of them like, like really, um, really big businessmen in Afghanistan, and they say, okay, let's meet in this hotel or in this restaurant uh, at 5 or 6 p.m. And we're like, sorry, this is not a good time for us to meet, or, and this is not a good place for us to meet. Let's meet in your office at, for example, lunchtime. <laughs> yeah, if you want to do it at, at your spare time, like if you want to do it sometimes that it does not take your uh, work hours, let's meet at, at your lunchtime. Or let's meet at our office at lunchtime. Um, so we have to really negotiate and have to have that ability uh, to negotiate on those uh, timings and so on. Uh, and a lot of work is required to be done with uh, government officials. Uh, Really, it doesn't matter um, how how committed or how uh, great they are. There's always a need to really gender sensitize them. You know, starting from maybe the president of the country to ministers, to deputy ministers, to uh, directors, at uh, uh, all kinds of sectors. I'm talking about so if it's business sector, or if it's, for example, let's say the elections commission, or if it's. Uh, the Ministry of Justice uh, or the um, Attorney's Office, uh, there's a huge need uh, for, for really uh, making uh, both men and women, but majorly men, to become uh, a little bit gender sensitive and understand those special, those special needs of uh, women uh, and to really uh, treat women with that sensitivity. That really, uh, that really does not exist. Mm -hmm. Let's take two more questions. Uh, Wade Channel has a question, and uh, I saw on, on, on the side right next to we see this lady there. So uh, why don't we, we start where the microphone is, um, right in front of you, Kasia. Hi. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, it's working. Okay. Um, my name is Siobhan Pierce. I work for the Women's Democracy Network at IRI. Um, and actually what you had just mentioned about the importance of sensitizing government officials um, and I imagine you can both speak to this. Um, what have you found is the best way to go about sensitizing um, leaders um, from the top down um, on gender issues? Okay, and a question up front. Yeah, uh, 
Uh, just just a moment. We'll take we'll take one more question. Sorry. Great. I'm Wade Channel from USAID. Um, uh, on sensitization, one comment. Uh, need to sensitize husbands too. That's my experience. Uh, we're not always so good at this. Um, we we're thrilled to see this kind of work. We're thrilled to see what's happening. And it's very easy for me as a as a white foreign senior male to come in and tell you challenge the status quo. But status quos don't like being challenged. And sometimes they're not very happy with those who do so. I'm gonna get on a plane once I've done challenging your status quo. I'm concerned about what, what kind of backlash do you see and what can we as donors and implementers and outsiders do to re either, re uh, well, to reduce and respond to the potential backlash of challenging the status quo? Thank you. Uh, okay, you wanted to, to start? I, either question or both. <laughs> the, talking about sensitization from top, you know, to bottom. Uh, one um, tool that has worked for us is the business you know, agenda. It, you know, it, it, it has yeah, worked. Sorry, the business, um, the national women business agenda. You know, having women organize themselves, you know, to look at all of the issues, you know, together across you know, sectors and prioritizing your issues. Because you can't take all of the issues at the same time. You know, you give yourself like a time limit. And also having women trained to identify the direction of government at you know, a particular time. It helps when you are engaging them. If they are focused on a particular you know, uh, direction and you are also on that path, it does help to make them you know, to listen and to do you know, something. So I will say, I, I will recommend the development of a business agenda for every, you know, uh, uh, women's or prof um, business women, professional women, you know, network or coalition. It does, you know, it will help so that you are not just going. It helps you to be focused. You are focused. You know what you know. You are up to. You know what you want to achieve. It, you know, it does, you know, uh, help in that, you know, regard. And one other thing that we also want to try as uh, a coalition is to also begin to engage government in terms of uh, actual you know, project. When you recognize the gaps you know, in some areas, you try to see, uh, to do something about it. It could be as simple as um, identifying girls that need to be mentored and um, making sure you are working with the, in Nigeria we have the Federal Ministry of Women Affairs and Social Development. We also have that ministry across states. You know, when you work together with ministries that are focused on women, and you are responsible, you know, um, for articulating or implementing projects that are focused on women. You know, it does help because they get to know what you are doing, and um, uh, they get to collaborate, you know, with you. They get to listen with uh, to you. So when there are issues and you take it up, they are ready to listen because they know you are not uh, antagonistic. You are collaborative, and you are ready to do something. You know, I, I think for us in Nigeria, that's um, been helpful knowing that we can work together with the government, that uh, we can articulate our issues and present it in a way that you know, is acceptable. But sometimes, 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 we are not as nice as that. We could, you know, we recognize the power of collective action and we are making use of that. Mm -hmm. okay. The backlash. Oh, the backlash, okay. Sorry, what was the question again? <laughs> um, uh, are the things donors can do to, to mitigate you know, negative reactions to, to your work? Uh, well, uh, I will, um, uh, the first thing, I think uh, the donors should also try to know the local organizations that are uh, the coalition, because sometimes I say they are focused more on government. Uh, that I say that, that they are more like government focused, government, um, uh, Okay, government focus is the is the word. I think if they focus on the the local you know organizations and try uh, to you know work you know, with them, it it, it 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 serves you know everybody you know right. And when government knows that, um, if if sometimes you can use the carrot and the stick you know with the government that oh, if you are we have and we see that in international relations sometimes when government you know goes beyond its bound. You know, donor agencies can withdraw support, you know, from government, and government don't like that. Particularly in developing 
countries because they look at that as source of um, some revenue, you know, to them. So if they are going to be backlash and they know that uh, this uh, agency is going to stand, you know, uh, firm. Uh, I, I was watching the news. I saw what's happening in China, for instance. That same approach, you know, you could, you know, adopt if a government, you know, is not so kind to its citizens. I think I do know agencies should take it as a responsibility to uh, ensure that the government understand that there could be consequences. Okay, okay so for gender sensitization, um, it's not just one intervention that would ensure that um, uh, men are gender sensitized. Um, it takes so many uh, yeah, multiple uh, interventions to be done. Uh, so we have done it through um, training workshops, uh, seminars to um, male government officials um, back in 2007 when I was working with uh, Germans, um, GIZ. Uh, we have done it uh, through um, providing them with uh, written material. Um, and uh, we have done it through empowering women uh, as their colleagues uh, to be able to really um, prove themselves and to um, to gain their trust and show that yes, if women are provided with the opportunity, they can have the same um, or, or or maybe higher um, ability to speak, to come up with ideas, to come up with plans, to um, create um, projects and so on. So it's not just uh, that um, we're talking about it. That okay, let's let's give women opportunity. Let's bring them in. Let's um, let's let's do um, everything for women, but also let's uh, enable women to do it, so they could see that yes, women can do it. So, for example, um, a lot of times in the meetings uh, when we uh, get in, um, in the beginning, of course, it's like, oh, okay, another woman. Uh, okay, so this is how the reaction is. But as soon as uh, we start talking, then that, you know, that changes the whole, um, the whole um, setting of the, that meeting and the whole perception of these men. And then, you know, by the end of the meeting, everybody looks at you and say, oh, can we meet separately? Can you please give me more information? I need help to increase women in my organization or I need help to increase, uh, to hire more women. Can you please help me with that? So this, this can really be um, effective. And in terms of backlash, um, I would say uh, what we have always um, suggested uh, to our colleagues in Afghanistan, uh, to our especially international um, communities or colleagues, that um, it's about how you um, communicate the content of the project, um, what you communicate and how you communicate. It's both of them. Um, so we have to be really sensitive, sensitive about that uh, because uh, it can be interpreted anyway, in, in any way that people would like to do, based on, of course, their uh, mindsets and their um, social uh, circumstance. Um, so we have to really um, uh, consider that, that, okay, if you are talking about uh, women's empowerment or women in business or um, women in uh, uh, politics, um, and if we have such a project or program, um, how, 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 and what content should be communicated to uh, to public, so it does not have uh, much back backlash on that. Barb, what are your thoughts? I think there's actually a piece to both questions that echoes back to what Andrew's opening remark remarks were about in terms of taking power oh. um, and credibility. Um, you know, Faluka was reminding me that politicians and policymakers respond to two things, money and votes. So if you are a single woman going in and asking for change and you're not demonstrating the 920,000 women voters that are behind that policy recommendation, you might not necessarily have your credibility, right? And I think in terms of um, the backlash, and again, I'm also coming from a, a similar background way, right? So, you know, it's, it's difficult for me perhaps to say, but I would suggest that maybe what we as the international community need to do is to also help lend credibility, to know about these efforts, to support these efforts, to know when there's a policy initiative going forward and challenge government 
say, have you talked to A and WBN about their their policy initiative on, you know, changing the way a central bank does uh, commercial loans or whatever it might be or collateral? Um, what do you think about that, right? And that in and of itself lends credibility to the movement. It lends credibility to the women behind that, and it it creates an echo chamber for their voice, right? Mm -hmm. uh, one question here. Uh, we can take one or two final questions. All right, seeing none, final call. Uh, yes. Uh, Virginia Little, John Quantum Leaps. This one is targeted to Barb, building on what Manisha was saying. Uh, first, one of the things we noticed in the US in the 80s was if we had men who had only daughters, uh, we identified a couple of real champions, one with four daughters, one with five daughters, and we turned them into our mega spokespeople for all kinds of things. But on what you were saying, Manisha, about getting the first lady engaged and then the president of the country, I wondered whether that was a conscious strategy of sight working with first lady organizations in other countries and continents, and whether you use that and if you also had a male champions of change strategy. Sure, sure. Um, as the center is developing, we're looking into to strategies that have worked in countries like Afghanistan and Nigeria and trying to echo those um, in other areas where we're working, networking uh, these organizations together and um, help, helping them learn from each other and helping us learn from our strategies as well. In terms of um, SITE's expertise and its, its strategy, I would say that it really has been encouraging the organizations to think critically about the champions within their communities and within their organizations and having them choose who makes sense to work with, right? Because while a first lady strategy might make great sense and it might be a great strategy, it might not work in every country. And it really has to be up to the, the local organizations to make that decision <coughs> and to advise us on that. Um, the importance from, from Sykes' point of view and in terms of how we do things is that idea of champions and, and who is that in your community and working with the organizations to think critically. Um, and Virginia, I apologize, I'm forgetting the second part of the question. Uh, Male champions yeah. of change and the first lady right. strategy right. as a vehicle to get to the president or the prime minister. Sure, sure. I mean, I think the, the same strategy holds true, actually, when you're talking about whether it's a first lady strategy or bringing men into the equation as well. Um, you know, I think when we're looking at a lot of these issues, the, the network, for example, Faluka was telling me about how the government in Nigeria was looking at hiking the rates to register businesses. And so the organization mobilized quickly through text messages, social media, uh, everything um, in terms of putting out the message that we need to resist this. This is bad for women in business. But not only is it bad for women in business, it's bad for business in general, right? So forming a coalition then with mainstream chambers of commerce, with male advocates on business, to say, we agree on this as well. We're 920,000 strong. Let us add our voice to yours um, to make that change happen, I think is, is critical. So I think, um, you know, from Sykes' standpoint and point of view, as we're thinking about these strategies moving forward, I don't want to get too far into the weeds and tell people that they have to do one thing or another. The key really is, who are those champions? Who are those surrogates that can work for you? Um, and who are they in your community? What does that mean to you? As a final remark now from each um, panelist, uh, what would be one takeaway or one thing to act on that, that you want people here to, to remember and leave with? Uh, one minute, Barb. Sure. Um, opportunity. From the standpoint that we're in right now in the community, the United States right now is putting forth a huge effort on women's economic empowerment. Whether we're talking about Congress, we're talking about the White House, we're talking about uh, the Chambers of Commerce, labor unions, there's a lot of focus on this effort to improve women's economic empowerment. So to the extent that we can partner together and take advantage on this opportunity, I welcome that um, and look forward to, to working with everyone in the future. Um, I would say, um these are long-term uh, impacting um, work. Um, 
so uh, we have to have patience and we have to have long-term um, strategies and long-term programming to really expect, expect results. And so uh, let's have that, the patience and long-term um, strategies and commitment to uh, work with the women of countries like ours to get that, that result that all of us are expecting. Thank you. I just want to say while we are um, investing in our number, building the number you know, of uh, the network of this coalition, I would just urge everyone you know, to look at investment in livelihood opportunities for women. I'm not talking about income only, I mean livelihood assets. Uh, because if we have, um, if we are empowered in that direction, I tell you the representation of women in Nigeria will increase. And that's what we need to do to increase women participation in politics, particularly business women. As it were, they are not interested because some of them think, oh, I don't want to soil my reputation. But they need to understand that unless you are in it, you can't take the decision. Thank you. I certainly appreciate what I've learned from each of you this morning about removing barriers in the enabling environment and about gender sensitization. So please join me in thanking our panel.